In topic two, we're going to discuss fetal distress or fetal compromise. And this is a very important topic, and it's one of the major causes of fetal death. Fetal distress is described as a condition in which there is lack of oxygen supply to the fetus, and the fetus becomes hypoxic right in utero. Fetal compromise in labor is an acute obstetric emergency, and the fetus needs to be delivered as quickly as possible. Now, fetal distress can occur in a lot of conditions. So what we mean is that any condition that can lead to lack of oxygen supply to the fetus will also will cause fetal distress. So for the causes, if you have malpresentations, such as in breach delivery, now in breach delivery, the buttocks will come, the legs will come, and the head will still remain high up. And then we take time to deliver the after coming head of the breach. And if that happens, then at the point, the oxygen supply to the fetus is limited. We have excessive sedation or analgesic administration. This causes depression of the respiratory center of the fetus. That is why when the woman is in labor and is in pain, when delivery is very close, or it will take about two hours for the woman to deliver, we don't want to sedate this baby immediately. If it becomes necessary that we sedate the mother, then immediately the baby is born, there is a need for us to give the baby some medications to help with the respiratory center. Anesthesia, which also causes extreme relaxation, can also cause lack of oxygen supply to the fetus. We also have prolonged labor, precipitate labor, hypertonic uterine action. When the contractions are abnormally high and strong, and there is, when the conditions are very strong and intermittently, there is no even time for the baby to relax in between contractions because they are frequent and they are very strong. It affects the oxygen supply to the baby. Placenta insufficiency due to maternal conditions. If the mother suffers any of the underlisted medical conditions, there is lack of oxygen supply to the placental bed. And if that occurs, then the baby's oxygen supply is also affected. So conditions like the diabetes, the preeclampsia, and all the others listed below. Then one other cord is what we call compression of the umbilical cord. If for any reason, you know that as the baby is coming, the cord is still attached to the placenta site, and it is still bringing oxygen to the baby and keeping the baby alive so the baby is completely out, then the cord will be completely detached. If there is anything pressing on the cord, then it is blocking the oxygen supply to the fetus. And in that sense, the fetus will lack oxygen. And fetal distress will set in. Especially when we have a true knot, where baby has turned several times and the cord has become a knot, and the knot becomes so tight that oxygen cannot even pass through. We could also have a prolapse cord, which we'll be discussing as the next topic, which is a very common cause of fetal distress, where the cord comes in front of the present, presenting part. Then cord entanglement. Sometimes baby can swim in the amniotic fluid and be entangled with the cord around the body or around the neck. And if that happens, then there'll be compression of the cord. We have overstimulation of the uterus with oxytocin. And then maternal anemia, prolonged pregnancy, maternal shock, antipartum hemorrhage, abruptual placenta and placenta previa. They can all lead to lack of oxygen supply to the fetus and then as a result, fetal distress will be seen. Now the indicators that are used to determine fetal compromise. How do you measure for fetal compromise? You use the fetal heart rate. You use the amniotic fluid measurement. You use the color of the amniotic fluid. You use the fetal acid balance. And then you use fetal movement. Now, if you are using these things to indicate fetal compromise or fetal distress, it is important that you know the normal ranges and the color and measurements of all these indicators so that you'll be able to determine fetal distress immediately it happens and intervenes appropriately. For the signs and symptoms, if you have any fetal heart rate above 160 beats per minute or fetal heart rate below 120 beats per minute, 
then the fetus is industrious. So once the fetus is industrious, it starts breathing very fast, the heart rate starts moving very fast, so it goes above the 116 after a long time, fetus gets tired, and then the, 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 the heart rate begins to drop. So it drops, and now it comes below 120. So either it is excessively high, which means fetus is still panting, or fetus has now relaxed, after a long panting and is tired and preparing for death, so it now comes into or comes below 140. So both are indicators of fetal distress. A fetal heart rate deceleration, reduction in fetal heart rate. It begins, it moves up, and then it declines. It tells you that no, this baby is tired and it's almost dying. Then irregular fetal heart rate. Now you get the heart rate, the next time it's missing. You get it on and off, then the baby is also in distress. Meconium stained lyco. Now, the amniotic fluid that surrounds the baby, if the baby is coming with a head, then the baby should not produce feces in the amniotic fluid before it comes. So if you see that the amniotic fluid has changed to become greenish, which indicates the presence of meconium, which is the first tool of the fetus, it tells you that the fetus was gasping in utero. So lack of oxygen causes the, baby, the fetus to gasp, and as it gasps on and off, then the feces is released into the meconium. So the meconium stains the lyco and become greenish lyco. So once you see a meconium stained lyco and the presentation is cephalic, then it tells you that the baby is, the fetus is in distress. Then we have excessive fetal movement. There is no oxygen, fetus needs oxygen. It's now tossing about and it's almost dying. So it moves from this part, it moves from this part then. The movement becomes so excessive. Fetus is struggling for life. How do we manage fetal distress? For all the management, if you look at the trend we are following at the community center or the health center and also in the hospital, you explain the condition well to the client and the, you reassure the client. You do abdominal examination to determine the presentation and descent of the fetal head. And then you do a vaginal examination you want to find out if, if, if there is progress in labor. Is labor so imminent? If labor is imminent, then let's hasten it. Now you do a vaginal examination, you find a cord around the neck or a prolapse of the, of the cord. It tells you that the baby, this is the cause of the fetal distress. And then you manage accordingly. If service is fully dilated, you check for descent. Is it zero over five, is it one fifth? And, and there is no cephalopelvic disproportion. So you look out for this. And then you perform episiotomy. And you perform vacuum extraction if trained. So what it means is that now you want to hasten. Baby's head is fully descent. Descent is complete. And then there is no CPD, so baby can come out. So you want to hasten the delivery. You perform a bilateral episiotomy, both sides. And then you want to put in a vacuum extractor and push out the baby immediately. You check for the fetal heart rate every 15 minutes. And if delivery does not occur within 30 minutes, you turn the woman to the left side. We have said that the woman lying on her left side will improve placental sufficiency and improve oxygen supply to the baby. And then you start IV infusion, ringers lactate. You start antibiotics and anti-malaria therapy if there is fetal tachycardia with maternal fever. And then at the community level, after you have done all these things, you refer this woman. Remember that in our referral at the community center, if it is a fetal distress, you don't leave the mother to go unaccompanied. You accompany the woman. If you have oxygen in your ambulance, you keep it. You continue administration of oxygen and monitoring the fetal condition till you get to the hospital. Now at the hospital, it could be that the woman just came to the hospital with the condition and they didn't go through the community. So you perform all these things that is also done at the community level, turning the woman. And if the woman is on oxytocin drug, then you turn off the drip immediately because oxytocin is going to give hyper contractions and the oxygen supply to the fetus is going to be diminished and the fetus is going to go into further compromise or further distress. 
You take your blood for grouping and cross matching. You are preparing for possibility of any cesarean session. You set up IV fluid, normal saline, or ringers lactate. Now, in fetal distress, I advise that you don't give dex you don't give dextrose. And then you administer your oxygen. You do abdominal examination. And now you do vaginal examination. You want to assess for cervical dilatation. Is the woman fully dilated? Is the presenting part good? What is the level of the descent? Is there any cord prolapse? We have said that cord prolapse will nip the cord and prevent the oxygen. So you manage all this. You check for the fetal heart rate. The doctor may perform fetal blood sample, not usually done in Ghana. And the membrane should be ruptured artificially. If they are still intact, you want to let the amniotic fluid come out and try to see if you can end the, the labor. You still monitor closely with the pathograph, but the recordings are quicker and often than you would have done in a normal situation. If the service is 9, 10 cm dilated, it means the woman is fully dilated and the level of the head or the descent is too thin. Then the woman is prepared for vaginal examination because any moment you can bring out this baby. CS is done if the woman is in the first stage of labor and fetal distress occurs too early and you will not have time to wait for all that hours for the service to dilate. So you have to cut and bring out the baby to save the baby. So fetal distress is one of the major indications for one of the major fetal indications for cesarean session. The, the pediatrician or the anesthetist must be informed to be present at the delivery. If it is a normal delivery or cesarean session, we need an expert at the time of delivery to resuscitate the baby. Now we go to topic three, cord prolapse or cord presentation. In fact, cord prolapse is one of the major causes of cord, one of the major causes of fetal distress. But it's important that we handle it because it is the main cause of fetal distress. And if we are able to manage cord prolapse effectively, then we will save a lot of the fetal distress conditions. Cord prolapse, there are various forms of cord prolapse. We have cord presentation. If it's cord presentation, then the umbilical cord lies in front of the presenting part and the fetal membranes are intact. So it means that the amniotic sac is not broken yet, the fluid is inside, but when you do vaginal examination, instead of you getting the head or the presenting part, you feel for some soft membranes before you go to the head. What it means is that with further descent, when the fetus head becomes completely engaged and it tries to, pee, it, it tries to stress on the surface, to widen the surface because the presenting part comes in front of the, the because the cord prolapse comes in front of the presenting part then the head is going to press on the cord and prevent oxygen supply to the fetus and then you're going to get fetal distress for cord prolapse the fetal the, the cord lies in front of the presenting part and the fetal membranes are ruptured so in, mo in both cord presentation and cord prolapse the, the cord lies in front of the presenting parts. The only difference is that in cord presentation, the membranes are intact, and in cord prolapse, the membranes are ruptured, so you can visibly see the cord in front of the presenting part. In the cord presentation, you can feel the cord in front of the presenting part. Now, in cord, cord prolapse, it is said to occur when the cord lies alongside, but not in front of the presenting part. And it is called occult cord prolapse because it is hidden. And this is a very serious situation because on examination, you may not see it in front of the presenting part. But it lies alongside the presenting part, and the presenting part still press on it on the sides. Cord prolapse is associated with all factors that maintain the presenting part above the pelvis. So any factor that maintains the presenting part above the pelvis also leads to cord prolapse. So any situation where for some reason, there is not well applied, the, the presenting part is not well, well applied to the lower uterine segment, nor well down in the pelvis. Then it allows for a loop of the core to slip down in front of the presenting part. What it means is that if the head is high for any reason and there is a space between the presenting part and where it is, 
then the cord which is connecting the umbilical cord to the fallopian tube will slip and come in front of the presenting part. So all the factors we'll be discussing are factors under which the head does not become fully engaged. So the first factor is multiparity. In multiparous women, the head may not be engaged when the membranes rupture because the uterine walls are very weak. The abdominal muscles are also weak because they have pushed and pulled several times and now they don't have so much tone in them. So when the abdominal muscles are weak, they are not able to guard the fetus directly towards the canal. So the fetus keeps balloting on its way and finally finds a way out. So when that happens, the presenting part can come in front, the cord can come in front of the presenting part and prolapse in mild positions. If the fetus is coming with the head, the head is the only part which is able to be well applied to the service and prevent anything, any space between the service and the head. So the head leads and continue opening till it is fully dilated and the head is the first to come. In mild positions, there is breach, mild positions and mild presentations. You can have sometimes breach presentation. In breach presentation, the cord is coming first, the buttocks is coming first, and the presentation, especially what we call complete breach or footling breach, the buttocks is coming and the, head, the legs are well flexed, and the cord is so close to the os. And because of the ill-fitting presenting part, and because of the nearness of the umbilicus to the buttox, the cord will slip and come in front of the presenting part. Also, when you have shoulder presentation, the shoulder is not big as the head. So the, the space between the cervix and the shoulder, the cord can come alongside it. In transverse life, where the baby lies across, there is a whole big space down. The baby just lies across the abdomen and the cord can slip from the umbilical region and present first before the baby. First, and then face and brow presentation can also cause prolapse due to the same reasons. This part cannot be well applied. It is a vertex position on the head that can be well applied to the service. So if you are coming with your face, there are spaces around and the core can slip along the face or the brow. And then in conditions we call high head. If membranes rupture spontaneously, when the head is high, you know the baby will be descending right from five feet and then coming down to two feet, one feet, and then we can visibly see the head. So when the head is very high and there is no descent, then the loop of the cord may be able to pass between the uterine wall and the fetus, and then it can lie in front of the presenting part. And it is very common in multi-gravid women. And then prematurity. Cord prolapse is common in prematurity because there is more room between the fetal head and the maternal pelvis. The baby is very small. And so there is so much space around so the core can just slip around and come and lead the presented part. And then when you have multiple pregnancy, it's associated with cord presentation and prolapse because of mal presentations. Mal presentation is very common when the babies are more than two, more than three, or more than four. Then you can have mal presentation being very common. Once you have mal presentations, the cord can come in front, and then you can have prolapse. The second twin, especially, is usually at a very high at a very high risk because it uses the extra space available to tend to become a mal presentation after the birth of the first twin. Remember, we have spoken about polyhydraminous a lot of times, and we have said that. This polyhydramnus allows the fetus to move too frequently in the uterus. It causes extension of extension of the abdomen, and there's too much fluid. So the movement within the fluid is too much, and then when that happens, the cord can come in front of the presenting part. Or when we rupture the membranes in polyhydramnus, in our management, remember we said that when you rupture the membranes, rupture it slightly and guide the, guide the fluid as it flows out. Because if you rupture it very wide and the fluid gushes out, it will sweep the cord alongside and bring the cord in front of 
the presenting part. Malformation or contraction of the pelvis and cephalopelvic disproportion. These are conditions associated with a high presenting part. And when there is a high presenting part, the cord can come in front. Now, fibroids occupy a space in the pelvis and prevent, prevent the head from becoming a, engaged. So once the head cannot engage, then the presenting cord can come in front. Then we have placenta previa. In placenta previa, we have said that the placenta is situated in the lower uterine segment and it occupies space in the pelvis and prevents engagement of the fetal head. So anything that will prevent engagement of the fetal head will subsequently also allow the presenting part to come in front. Now how do we diagnose cord presentation? If you want to diagnose cord presentation, you do vaginal examination and you can feel the cord either in the intact membranes in front of the presenting parts or the membranes might have ruptured. And sometimes we try to go around to see if it is occult and it can be felt on the sides of the presenting part. The umbilical cord is soft. So once you do VE, you realize that there's a very abnormally soft tissue. And then you know that this is the cord presenting. And there will be pulsations in the cord. So once you do and you touch in over, they realize that there is a membrane very soft and it is pulsating. You know that the cord is presenting. If the presenting part is high, the cord may float away from the examining fingers. So once you go in, they realize that the cord keeps shifting around the examining fingers and they feel very soft. Cord presentation is rarely detected and there may be changes in the fetal heart rate, such as decelerations, reduction in the heart rate, or missing heartbeats. So you seek medical care, you reassure the client, you put the woman in an exaggerated sums position, the hips and buttocks raised on pillows in the exaggerated sums position. It's like the woman goes on her two arms and then also on her knees and the abdomen is raised in between. What it does is that it pushes the weight of the baby off the cord so that there will be more blood su oxygen supply to the fetus. And then you stop vaginal examination to avoid rupturing the membranes. And then you check the fetal heart rate continuously, or at least every 15 minutes. You do vaginal examination to exclude prolapse as soon as membranes rupture. And then the outcome is that there may be the need for caesarean section to prevent fetal distress that we discussed earlier on. In the health facility, you reassure the client. You f if, if the cord, if, if you feel for the cord around the neck and you check if there's any pulsating in the cord. If there is pulsating in the cord, then you prevent cord from coming out of the vagina. If pulsations are not felt, it might be due to cord compression. It tells you that there is something compressing the cord and the fetus might be dead in uterus. So you prevent cord from coming out of the vagina. Now, immediately the cord comes out of the vagina, it will be thrown into spasms because of atmospheric change in the atmospheric temperature. So you make sure that you keep the cord in the vagina. There is some warmth in, in there. If it has come out, then you wear a glove and push it in, and then you put a pad on it so that you, you put some warmth on the cord. And you prevent cord compression by preventing parts of the cord, or you instill 300 mils of normal saline in bladder through the indwelling catheter of normal, of normal saline through, sorry, of normal saline to the bladder through an indwelling catheter. And then you place the woman in the left lateral position and elevate the hips on pillows to put her in the knee chest position if possible. So that, like I said earlier on, the weight is lifted off the cord. You administer high concentration of oxygen to the mother, to the, then to the fetus. You administer high concentration. We say that once the oxygen gets to the mother, maternal oxygen saturation in the blood will be high, and then the baby will have some oxygen. And then you give IV infusion, normal saline or ringers like that. You do a vaginal examination. You are still delivering immediately. Once the cord is coming out, if delivery is not imminent, then we may have to do caesarean session to bring out the baby. 
if delivery is closed and all other signs, full dilatation of cervix, descent is very good, then you do bilateral episiotomy and you do vacuum extraction to bring out the baby. If cord is not positive, check for signs of obstructions, which may include edema of cervix or mild caputs or molding. If there's obstruction, you give antibiotics, a broad spectrum antibiotic is preferred. And then if no signs of obstruction and the presentation is favorable, you allow the woman to have normal delivery. So in the hospital, if it's the first stage of labor, you call the doctor immediately. If there is any oxytocin or you are trying to induce labor, you stop immediately. Explain the condition to the mother. If it is pulsating, it means that there is life in it. Prevent the cord from coming out like we said, and then you place part on vagina. If cord is lying outside, it should be gently replaced. If you press on the cord, remember that it will be thrown into spasms. And as it is thrown into spasms, oxygen supply to the fetus is affected. So you position the woman like we discussed in the community, the same management, and then you, you instill the fluid into the bladder and cause a full bladder. You are causing a full bladder because you want to prevent further contractions. We know that when the bladder is full, contractions will not be very frequent. So once you instill and inflate the bladder, then the contractions will be minimized and there will not be too much compression on the cord. So oxygen therapy is on, IV infusion is on. You still do further examination of the service. When you're doing the vaginal examination, you want to note you should be, it, should be, it should be minimized because we have said earlier on that the more you go in and out, you are tampering with the cord. We want to avoid any spasms. IV fluid is set up, you take the blood for grouping and cross matching, and then you still keep the cord intact, and at the hospital, you do a cesarean session. If it occurs in the second stage, second stage means that service is fully dilated. So if service is fully dilated, then we can hasten the delivery. If it's not possible to hasten the delivery, then we opt for CS. The dangers and complications. You have hypoxia. The fetus is at risk of having an oxygen supply cut. And the cut may be to the brain. And if it, it cuts, the oxygen supply to the brain is cut, then every vital organ which is being supplied by the brain is also affected. So depending on where it, it occurs, there could be so many signs or effects or complications. So when the cord is compressed between the presenting part and the maternal pelvis, then we could also have spasm of umbilical vessels, like we said, caused by cooling, drying, or handling of the cord. And earlier, when we were doing the prevention, we have spoken that don't touch it unnecessary. Don't let it come out. If it's out, push it back into the vagina. The baby could also die as a result of the cut of oxygen supply to the fetus occurring from the prolapse of the cord. To the mother, because there may be the need for intervention, then she is also prone to the risk of anesthesia, like the Mendelssohn syndrome, where the woman inhales her own vomiting and she dies. She can have hemorrhage, she can have sepsis or infection, and then we could also have some maternal distress occurring. So we have learned that both the mother and the fetus can be in distress, and we must prevent it because they are all obstetrical emergencies. For topic four, we're looking at ruptured uterus. Ruptured uterus is a total disruption of the wall of the pregnant uterus with or without expulsion of its contents, either the baby or the placenta. So we can have the walls of the uterus being disrupted or we can have a big trauma to the walls of the uterus and the baby may still be in it or sometimes the baby can jump out of the uterus but the placenta will still be in the uterus. And here we are talking about an intact skin. So the abdomen is it's not like it's occurring during surgery. So the, in, the skin is intact, but you palpate, and then the uterus has ruptured within. 
It's one of the major life-threatening complications in obstetrics. It comes with very severe type of pain, which can lead to shock. And it must be guarded against. We should be able to detect this condition early enough and intervene because the next moment this woman can die. We can have a complete rupture of the membranes. And this involves a tear in the wall of the uterus with or without expulsion of the fetus. And the peritoneum overlying the uterus is also disrupted. So some can have the uterus being rupturing, but then the peritoneum is entered. In complete rupture, the uterus is, there's a big trauma to it, it is ruptured, and even the peritoneum which overlies it is also ruptured. In incomplete rupture, it involves tearing of the uterine wall, but not the perimetrium. The perimetrium is the peritoneum that covers the uterus. The hisense of an existing uterine scar may also occur, and this involves rupture of the uterine wall, but the fetal membranes remain intact, and the fetus is retained within the uterus and not expelled into the peritoneal cavity. So in this condition, the woman had a previous caesarean scar, and then during the pushing and retractions, that scar can open, and the uterus will rupture. Ruptured uterus can also be described as traumatic when, the when it is preceded by some form of inter intervention. Like you try to do a cephalic version where the buttons was coming, so let me bring the head down. And you did your manipulation inside the uterus and then the uterus ruptured. We refer to it as traumatic rupture. You could also have a spontaneous rupture where it occurs without any manipulations. The uterus just decided to rupture. Now let's look at the causes of ruptured uterus. We have discussed obstructed labor already. So if the labor is obstructed, there is still contractions happening, like in hypertonic uterine contractions. Nothing is coming out so that the uterus will stop contracting. It wants to expel the contents of the uterus. So it continues and then it ruptures. In high parity women, their uteruses are weak so as they keep giving birth, five by the sixth birth, they can also rupture the uterus. It's like a balloon blown on and off. Balloon is tired. So the next time you try to blow, the balloon just ruptures. And then you try hyperstimulation with ozotoxins, particularly in the presence of disproportion. So that's why we say anytime we talk about induction of labor, the first statement we say is that rule out any cephalopelvic disproportion. Because if you try to stimulate the labor, you try to hasten it, but there is an obstruction, baby can simply not come out. Then in, you want to just rupture the uterus. Previously scarred uterine, previously scarred uterus is, as found in CS or hysterectomy can also, is also a typical cause. In uterine manipulations, we have said that internal podalic version, what you call cephalic version now, it is, it is outdated in, in current obstetric practices. We don't want to talk about cephalic version. There is manual removal or retain placenta. And then if you do neglected labor, where there is previous history of caesarean CS, and you don't monitor the labor closely, this woman can also rupture. If you have a ruptured caesarean section scar, this is difficult to detect as the rupture is silent. And the rupture may not be on the skin, but it may occur under the skin in some other layers. So you may not, it may be so conspicuous, and it is very dangerous. There is lower abdominal pain in between contractions, and there is slight vaginal discharge. This woman may go into shock if there is a greater degree of bleeding, or if the, 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 the tear becomes complete. Rupture during obstructed labor. So we are looking at the clinical manifestations. And the manifestations differ depending on what is causing the rupture. It manifests as such. If there is a history of long, difficult labor, and then you see the bundle shrink and obstructed labor. If there are signs of severe shock, such as cold, moist skin, low blood pressure, feeble and rapid pulse, fast weak pulse, then you know that you are having 
some signs. If there is a woman, if the woman complains of severe abdominal pains with something giving way, so he says, I feel that something is opening. Something is opening up. And she really feels it. And it may not be obvious to you, so you listen to her and then you follow up with other checks. If then you could also have sudden collapse. Sudden, if the woman is delivering and in the course of delivering intrapartum, she collapses suddenly. It is likely as a result of rupture of the uterus. Now, if you have rupture during obstructed labor, intrapartum rupture, the heart sounds may be lost. So you are listening to the fetal heart rate now, you don't find it again. And there may be changes now, it is very slow, it's, you are missing beats. And there may be evidence of fresh vaginal bleeding. The uterine bleeding, is, the blood coming from uterine rupture is different from ordinary bleeding during labor. What happens is that because they are coming from open blood vessels, they are fresh and then they are bright red. And the uterine contractions may stop. So you have intense uterine contractions, hyper contractions. At the point, there are no uterine contractions. So it tells you the uterus has ruptured, so it's not contracting anymore. And then the contour of the abdomen changes. So the woman came, you could see the abdomen of the pregnant woman, and then now you find a depression in the abdomen. Some say it becomes saucer shape. You know the shape of a saucer. So the middle becomes depressed. It tells you that the uterus might have ruptured. The fetal parts can be palpated easily through the abdominal wall. So now you take the abdomen and you are touching the fetus. It tells you that she has come, the fetus has come out of the uterus. The degree and speed of the mother's collapse and shock depend on the extent of the rupture and the blood loss. At the community level, uterine rupture, we have said, is an obstetric emergency. Position client, you provide warmth, all the other investigations or management we did, taking blood for grouping and cross-matching because we may have to transfuse. IV fluids are given, monitoring vital signs, and then because you be trans this woman, I say that any time you meet a woman with obstetric emergency, you don't say, Madam, go to Kolebu. You follow this woman to the referral center. A midwife should be present and equipped to carry out delivery or anything that will care to, to be able to manage shock and improve the baby's condition as you, tra you travel with the woman. So you refer appropriately. And the hospital, you call the doctor immediately, you realize the changes we have spoken about. The client should be in the left lateral whilst you are waiting, you provide them warmth, and then you've done your blood, your grouping and cross match. You are giving some plasma expanders in the form of IV fluids. You monitoring vital signs continuously. You are having an indwelling catheter, monitoring urinary output and intake, and then antibiotics come in. You give drugs accordingly, and you prepare the client physiologically, psychologically for cesarean session. And the doctor will perform hysterectomy. Sometimes they try to repair the uterus, depending on the severity. If it's a complete rupture, then repair may not be possible, and there may be the need to end everything and bring out the uterus. In uterine rapture, when we are caring for this woman, remember that we want to do intensive resuscitation. We want, there is a need for emergency laparotomy. It's not like a, a, a small cut for cesarean section. We are opening wide the abdomen because this woman might have bled into the peritoneum. You, do a, you give a broad spectrum antibiotics and adequate post-operative care. Our complications, maternal complications we have, before the surgery, you could have hypovolemic shock, you could have infection. This woman could die because I said that the uterus rupture, it comes with intense pain that can cause death. Apart from, that can cause shock and death. Apart from that, the, the, the fact that the intense pain can cause shock, the blood that you are losing could also cause hypovolemic shock. After the surgery, the woman could have pyrexia as a result of infection. You could have intestinal obstruction because we manipulated 
the intestines or the abdominal organs, anemia should occur, and then you could have adhesions where some of the organs adhere to each other, and it could lead to subsequent problems in the near future. Genital tract and wound sepsis can also occur, and then urogenital fistula, vesicle vagina fistula can also be a complication. Let's also now look at the fetal complications. Once these things are happening, we are, the mother is losing blood, mother is developing shock and all that, the fetus will also experience hypoxia in utero. We could also have a condition where the fetus could also become anemic if the bleeding was so, so severe. Ruptured uterus may result in the death of both the mother and the fetus, and that is commonly the case. You look out for all the warning signs, rising pulse, tonic contractions, bundles ring, tenderness of the lower abdomen, fetal distress. All these are warning signs. And don't wait too long before you intervene when you see all the signs. It tells you that the uterus is rupturing and any moment the mother and the baby could be in shock and subsequently die. That brings us to topic five, which talks about obstetric shock. So we all know the definition of shock. So if you are talking about shock, obstetric shock, then we are just talking about shock occurring as a result of pregnancy or during labor. So these are all definitions of shock, which we have done in medicine. So let's go continue. We have classifications of shock. We have hypovolemic shock, which is very common in obstetrics. Because any time you lose blood and we, 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 the, the volume of the blood goes down, we can easily have hypovolemic shock. And usually when we have postpartum hemorrhage, that's what happens and that's what causes the death in the woman. We can also have cardiogenic shock due to impaired ability of the heart to pump blood. Now, as the, the woman is bleeding, the heart is trying to bring in more blood into circulation. At the point, the heart gets tired of pumping, and it leads to cardiogenic shock. We also have distributive shock, and this is primarily due to poor distribution of blood to tissues or cells in case of sepsis or anaphylactic or allergic problems. Sometimes it could just be as a result of a drug reaction or reaction to anesthetic agents. An athletic shock is produced by injection of protein to which the patient is sensitive. Obstetric shock is a condition in the mother which occurs as a result of reduction in blood flow to the tissues. It's, it may be produced by severe illness or trauma. So cause of obstetric shock we've mentioned in our We've done classification of shock already, so we spoke about hypovolemic shock. So these are the factors that causes hypovolemic shock. Anything that can cause bleeding like retained products, inversion of the uterus, broad ligaments, hematoma, rupture of the uterus like we just discussed, they can all cause hypovolemic shock. If the woman is also vomiting severe, severely, remember that she's losing fluid and she can also have dehydration and hypovolemic shock. Now, non-hemorrhagic shock, you know, in, in obstetrics, it can be due to tracing of the ovarian cyst. The woman could be having ovarian cyst. She could always be complaining of pain on one side of the abdomen, either left or right ovary, and then she could be walking and this ovary will just twist. And if it twists on itself, she can have a sudden shock and it's non-hemorrhagic, but then this woman can die. Acute cardiac failure could also lead to non-hemorrhagic shock. So non-hemorrhagic shock is referring to any other condition that leads to shock apart from bleeding. Anesthetic accidents, we said that, reaction to drugs, coronary thrombosis, acute inversion of the uterus. They are all and causes of non-hemorrhagic shock. And then if you have septic abortion too, you could also have a septic shock. And then embolism, air embolism, thromboembolism, amniotic fluid embolism, like we explained earlier on, maternal exhaustion, sudden reduction in intra-abdominal pressure, 
example, following twin delivery, where one comes out and there is a sudden reduction in the abdominal pressure, we could also have shock occurring. The complications, we have renal failure, and then we can also have death. And they all occur because of how the body reacts to loss of circulating fluid, how the heart tries to pump in to compensate, how the blood pressure is reduced so that the veins are relaxed and blood pressure is reduced to allow free flow of blood to the other parts of the body and how cardiac output and venous return falls. These are all attempts to help in the initial stages to get blood to the parts that have limited blood supply. And then the drop in the blood pressure decreases oxygen supply to the tissue cells and their functions are affected. Now the next stage after the initial stage is the compensatory when the, the, the body says that let me try to compensate for this change that I'm experiencing. And because of that urinary output is reduced, exchange gases is also impaired and then respiration becomes shallow and then the woman develops what we call sighing and irregular respiration. The pupils of the eyes are also dilated and then the sweat glands are stimulated. So this, we, we mentioned all the clinical manifestations, but this is giving us the physiology as to why these things occur. And because these sweat glands are stimulated and they are opened, that is why we have the moist and clammy skin that we mentioned when we're discussing when, as in shock. And it is released from the adrenal medulla. And the aldosterone is also released from the adrenal cortex an antidiuretic hormone is also secreted by the posterior pituitary gland. The body realizes that I'm in, in, in a state of imbalance. So let me do anything possible that I can do to, as a compensatory mechanism to stop me from dying. And that is what happens in the compensatory stage. And venous return to the heart will increase, but unless fluid loss is replaced, and this will not be sustained. Then we go to a progressive stage where the compensatory mechanisms failed. So now vital organs are affected. They lack blood supply or they lack perfusion. And then the blood pressure or cardiac output fall, coronary arteries suffer lack of supply, peripheral circulation becomes poor, and there is weak or even absence of pulsations. And this stage leads to multiple system failure. So you can have brain damage, you can have kidney damage, all the vital organs can fail. In the final stage, we call it the irreversible stage. Now all the systems fail. And once you have a total system failure, then you know that death is the obvious thing to happen. So depending on which organs the limited supply occurs in or the ischemia occurs in, then the effects also occurs. So if it occurs in the brain, like I said, you will find brain damage. So it will start with restlessness, confusion, unconsciousness. If it's, it occurs in a major organ like the, the, the lungs, you have impaired exchange, then you have this woman having ischemia. And within a short time, this woman begins to gasp for air. And the lungs become edematous. And then the, because we have increased permeability, and this worsens the problem of diffu oxygen diffusion. So respiratory failure results, and then there is a high respiratory distress. Another organ like the kidney, we have said that once the kidney is always working with blood, every second millions of volumes of blood is being pumped to the kidneys to push to other organs to filter it and all that. The kidney's warehouse uses only blood. So if you reduce the volume that it needs to work with, and then to a point that you have less than output of 200 mils per hour, then it tells you that this factory that, was, that needs blood to work, there is no raw material, so the kidney will shut down. And the GIT can also shut down, and then there is in a, the gut, it's not able, the gut is not supplied with adequate blood. And because of that, 
the ability of the gut to function is also impaired and the barriers against infection also falls and gram-negative bacteria are available to enter circulation and then you may have septicemia. The liver failure may also occur if you have lack of blood supply to the liver. It will not be able to excrete the waste adequately. So we all know what we will experience and we have tried to explain the physiology as to what happens before we have the rapid breathing, what causes the coldness and clammy skin and all the other signs that we know of already. In our treatment, we want to give prophylaxis. Anemia must be treated very well at the antenatal period. We carefully watch for maternal distress, which we have discussed earlier on, so the woman doesn't enter into shock. You avoid ketosis and dehydration with timely intravenous infusion, and then blood must be conserved at all times for emergency transfusion, so that if it becomes necessary to transfuse this woman, we can do it. So at the community level, obstetric shock is emergency. You call for urgent and immediate help, and then you just want to mobilize. Once you stabilize the woman, then you are going to refer. So once she comes in shock, you are doing resuscitation, you are arranging for transport, you are arranging for a blood donor to accompany her to the site. You position site that blood flow will be adequate, placental perfusion will be good. You give IV fluids, and like I said, you should always accompany this person. So on your way, you are monitoring vital signs. You are giving oxygen if you have, and you are trying to arrest the hemorrhage if possible, especially if it's a laceration. And then you explain the condition to the relatives. You don't keep them anxious. And you accompany this person to the hospital. In the hospital, shock is still an emergency. We try to do all the things we have mentioned earlier on, elevating the legs, keeping the woman warm, taking blood for grouping and cross-matching, setting up our IV, and then we give our oxygen, we maintain our intake and output. In the hospital, we want to treat the underlying cause. You identify and you, are, you manage. So after the initial resuscitation, then now you identify the cause and you manage the accordingly. You realize that the causes are many. So depending on what is causing it, you treat accordingly. These are the references and this brings us to the end of this session. It is important that you see this as an obstetric emergency because any moment you can lose this woman, we can also lose the baby.